today I'm joined by Nikki Jones. Uh, Nikki is from Avon Needs Trees, a charity based in Bristol that's doing some amazing work buying land in the Bristol area for reforesting. And um, we're going to hear a lot more about this whole journey of uh, the importance of trees as we go through this. So welcome, Nikki. Well, thank you very much for having me. So tell us a little bit about the, the sort of the early days of the journey um, for Aiden Needs Trees because clearly it's, uh, it's not something that um, you can go into half-heartedly. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, well, I would say, first of all, that the charity is less than a year old. We really only got going about this time in uh, 2019 and registered as a charity in July that year. So we are very new. Um, but yes, I guess to explain how it got going... Um, perhaps I should explain my background is writing about energy in particular and for the last few years I've been giving talks about that on on the you know in the context of climate change and really getting people to understand their energy use uh, and so on but that meant that I really had to start to understand land use because obviously land use uh, agriculture forestry and so on is about 25 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions and I it was an area of course like most people I kind of thought I sort of understood it but the more I read the more I realized I absolutely didn't um, so I had to learn a huge amount so that I could go on and explain it to other people and then I suppose that led me down the path that I think many people are going down these days of thinking well you know I'd inherited a bit of money should I go and buy a few acres of land myself and plant it up and have the fun of a forest myself and I realized that actually that's uh Every time I got close to it, I kept backing off because I realised that actually I wasn't sure that I could take on that commitment, that personal commitment. Um, and of course, there are those issues about what happens in the next generation. Would that would that be permanent and so on? So then I looked at co-buying with friends um, with people that I'd met through doing my talks, in fact. So they're all enthusiasts. And again, very quickly, we took advice, but we realized that legally that got very complicated. You know, what happens if somebody wants to withdraw their money or somebody dies, uh, inheritance issues and so on. So again, sort of, we sort of stalled at that one. And at the same time, I was going to various other talks um, and I went to a couple by the Environment Agency and I suddenly became aware of this issue which I, I guess I was aware of but I had never seen that map of the Bristol Avon catchment area which just shows how very very deforested our catchment area is and for the first time I really realized this wasn't just an issue about carbon sequestration and biodiversity which we were waking up to but also natural flood management how do we adapt to climate change because we're not going to stop it um, completely we hope to mitigate it but we're not going to stop it and we need to think about how we adapt and flooding of course is a big risk and one thing that really struck me again i'd never even heard the term but tidal lockup um, and what uh, what the environment agency explained was that when you look at the map we, Bristol is at the bottom of this uh, series of rivers that comes down into the city um, and the problem for Bristol is that when we've got a very high incoming tide and it's met by a very heavy rainfall inland, the water finds its way down to the city very quickly and there's nowhere for it to go. And in fact, we pretty much had that last September. But of course, it also affects the heavy inund inundations inland is also affecting most of the towns and cities in our catchment area. So Bath, Milksham, Trowbridge, all the others are also badly affected now by flooding and have a serious issue with that. So one way or another, um, so I approached the council who were putting out ideas for their City Leap uh, initiative, which was their idea at that time about going carbon neutral by 2050. And I sort of said to them, look, hang on, this is double whim. You could have some negative emissions and do some uh, flood management, natural flood management at the same time. And they got it. But obviously, it's politically, it's difficult for them to invest outside their catchment, outside the, the city boundaries. So they, so basically I kind of went away, blah, 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 all sorts of things. At the same time, somebody asked me to go and see a piece of land. They knew I was looking out for land and they asked me to go and see this piece of land, the one we're now purchasing, which is called Hazeland, um, between Chippenham and Carlne. It's 34 acres of very beautiful mixed habitat and it kind of ticked every box. It's got a river frontage on the River Marden, which tips straight into the, um, the Avon just around Chippenham. Um, 10 acres of ancient woodland, very neglected on it, plus all this pasture land, low grade pasture land, no good for farming, very poor access. Um, and um, 
ideal for, for reforesting and rewilding. So one way or another, sort of everything came together. And I, of course, I went off immediately and talked to the Woodland Trust and um, all other parties, you know, the Bristol Avon Rivers Trust and so on. And they were all enthusiastic about it. But it was a case of, right, you do it. <laughs> the Woodland Trust in particular were, have been incredibly supportive and they've been wonderful to us. Um, but they said we wouldn't really touch a piece of land less than 100 acres. So um, for them, it was too small, but they were prepared to support us. And of course, I sat there like a sort of rabbit in the headlights for a couple of months thinking, oh, what a crazy thing to do, you know, because I knew, first of all, we would have to get a land valuation done, an independent land valuation, because it was extremely overpriced. And then there, I would have to raise hundreds of thousands of pounds to even buy this first piece of land. And, you know, I kept thinking, this is crazy. Why would I do it? but I couldn't quite leave alone this beautiful piece of land. And, and you know, the public enthusiasm whenever I talked about it. And so one way or another, we, there were five of us initially, and we signed the documents, we sent them off to the Charity Commission uh, to register as a charity. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, once you start to kind of open up this, what well, what feels a bit like a can of worms, really, doesn't yeah. it? Because you know, to, to begin with a dream, begin with an idea of, you know, doing doing so much good, you know, in in the local yeah. area, which has this spin off knock on effect in so many good ways, and then it's almost like once you open that little can of worms, oh my goodness, what else comes out? Because you've got all these other organisations sitting around the periphery. Some have a vested interest. Some are on the the edge of it some are sort of politically leaning some are much more kind of sort of eco sustainability leaning and you're you're entering into this whole kind of soup of possibilities but also challenges i mean where did you sort of from that sort of early those early days where did you start to kind of almost sort of prioritize your attention because i guess you could spread yourself so thin Yes, I get it. so there were some immediate priorities. First of all, what we had to do, as I say, was get an independent land valuation because this was a non-starter. If we were going, you know, we wouldn't be able to get any funding at the price that was being asked at that time. So we had to do a crowdfunder even before we registered as a charity. Um, we had to do that almost immediately. And it was fantastic. We had to raise about a thousand pounds for that. And we got that money within three days. So that was people putting an enormous amount of faith in us. Um, I would say, I guess I'm very much helped because of the talks I've been doing over the years that I've got a good mailing list. So I guess people had known my work a bit. So that helped, I think. So, um, so we got the money for that. So got that happening. And then it would, took a few weeks to really negotiate a lower price on that particular piece of land. But the other priority was then to get, it's the bureaucratic stuff. You have to, you can't have a bank account until you're registered as a charity. You can't register for gift aid until you've got a bank account. And so, you know, you set in train this series of things, which, you know, they tell you, the charity commissioner will say, you can register for a charity in four to six weeks or whatever. It takes much longer. It took us about, I think in the end, about three months. Um, uh, and that wasn't, because we did anything wrong or anything. It just took that amount of time. And then of course, applying for a bank account, that takes about another eight weeks, you know, and you've got to get all the signatures together. And so, you know, bureaucratically, it, those things kind of took over. So in the meantime, so we had to then really, once we'd negotiated the price was get going on the fundraising, which became the real priority, even before we were registered on the basis that there was no reason why we wouldn't register and so on so we so that's how it started so really i started i was doing talks all over the place on energy generally and asking for donations to avonese trees um and just doing the publicity um you know oh it's all the usual things getting banners printed and leaflets printed and turning up at small village fates and all that kind of stuff and really trying to get the word out and you know all I can say is that the public enthusiasm was absolutely there. I mean, we did a couple of bigger crowdfunders after that initial one for the valuation. And I think we raised, I think around, I think it, it would be about 35,000 through those. Um, I can't remember the exact figures, but it was an enormous whoosh of support for, again, as I say, a, a sort of unknown charity, which was fantastic. So... Um, yeah, so all those things took over. And at the same time, you've got to kind of get your 
the board working, the board of trustees working. I mean, I've, I've sat on various boards and I've worked a lot of my life in the voluntary sector, but I've never had to put together a board before. So, um, you know, I had some great trustees right from the beginning from Wiltshire Wildlife Trust, the uh, Rivers Trust, the local council, local friends of the earth and myself. But we realized fairly soon that I, I was doing most of the fundraising in the administration. Oh, actually, can I just say there's one other thing that really got us going, and this is a kind of word to anybody who's thinking about doing it. I took the plunge and decided to pay my son to do the administration for us for 10 months. So that came out of my um, money. And to be honest, we, again, without um, paid administrative help, I certainly couldn't have done it. You know, the amount of form filling and oh, just general running around and organising of stuff um, would have been beyond me, given that I was still doing all my other normal life. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it, that took a financial commitment from me to do it, to, to get things going. I mean, they wouldn't have happened without. I'm sure a lot of people watching and listening to this have got a big dream. They've got this big idea. Uh, they know it's a good thing to do, but it's almost then they're falling at maybe the first hurdle because they might not have the specific contacts or the expertise. Mm -hmm. And like you say, you're, it's almost like you're, you're committing to sort of buy in that, um, that level of expertise that you need to kind of move through those first few hurdles. When, when you're sort of looking for um, sort of trustees or others to really be part of that sort of almost inner circle, if you like, um, were, were you selecting on kind of sort of people you know who were, you know, you knew that they would be able to build the momentum with you? Or was it very much like a specialism? Because, you know, if I was forming a business, for example, I'd be looking for very kind of sort of specialist areas. W was it the same for you? Um, it was a little bit, uh, the initial bit was really... Um, I, first of all, I should say, I didn't know any of the trustees before I started Ava Needs Trees. So they weren't personal contacts. One has now joined us who I did know, uh, and he's become our treasurer, and um, he's great. Um, but, but I suppose the point is, I, I guess, first of all, it was just pulling together all those who, th those initial five of us, including myself, who'd expressed an interest uh, in it and had clearly they had real relevant contacts and expertise to pull together onto the board. But I guess as we've gone on, and particularly this year, we've been able to look much more carefully at how we grow as a board. Again, we're very new, having to think about all these things, but um, you know, what's the maximum number of trustees we want to have and where are the gaps? So for example, we've just identified, first of all, we identified we needed more professional fundraising help. So we've now brought in um, a, a professional trust fundraiser and she's fantastic. Um, I've now just asked a woman um, who is a um, very well-known PR and press manager uh, in Bristol to join us and she'll be joining us uh, at the next committee meeting as an observer trustee so all our new trustees are on at least a three-month observation period from them for them and for us uh, and then uh, we make a decision about whether to go ahead so um, so yes I, I guess at the to answer your question I guess at the beginning it was a little bit uh, like just pulling in whoever looked like they might be good and now we've just become a little bit more strategic about uh, exactly where are the gaps and what we need on our board. What I'm picking up, and I think it is, it's very, very clear from just the way that you uh, sort of present um, the charity and the way that you talk about it, is that there is this kind of longer term vision, this longer term view. It's not that you're just getting a load of people's money and donations in, you're thinking, right, let's just go and buy some land. And then it's on a wing and a prayer that kind of what happens next. It feels like you're beginning to sort of grow this very kind of organically from a strong sort of secure centre. Is, is, is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say, first of all, it is a very professional team now I've got around me, which is fantastic. Um, and yes, I mean, we chose the name Ava Needs Trees. A lot of people don't, don't pick up on it immediately, but we are ants. You know, we realise, you know, we are small, but we can move mountains. And really, I've always seen this as a minimum, minimum 20 year project. I mean, we're buying our first piece of land now. We're beginning to look for our second piece of land, um, you know. I hope that that's the momentum we will carry, that we will be buying at least one piece of land per year. And of course, there's the possibility that we'll be left land in legacies. We've talked to other organisations about other 
models. Um, the point being always that we want to be able to create new permanent woodland. So, um, you know, whatever way the land comes to us, as long as it satisfies those goals, then we're happy with it. But, um, but yes, so it, it is, it does feel like we're having to think very carefully about how we grow uh, and, and what our, but also our long-term vision and realizing, of course, I mean, it's quite a responsibility. We now have taken hundreds of thousand pound, of pounds worth of um, public money. We're going to be landowners. This is a multi-generational project. This has to go on beyond us. So we are like a sort of mini Woodland Trust, I guess. Um, so, you know, that's quite a responsibility of how you work that out you know, how you safeguard everything for the future. It's interesting that this word legacy, which, you know, you've said a couple of times in sort of varying sort of forms there. And I think that's really kind of what I'm picking up here is that this is very much a, and I love that phrase, you know, the permanent woodland, because I think there's, there's a lot of box ticking happening right now. And I wouldn't necessarily call it greenwash, but it, in some cases it probably is greenwash um, with organizations looking to give back and looking to sort of be part of this big um, sort of eco movement. I think what you're creating here, though, is something that's so much more substantial than that, isn't it? Because this is, if it's a permanent woodland, you know, mm. the clue is in the word permanent there. It's something that is going to be here for future generations and future, future generations. And I think for me, that's, that's a really important sort of, I guess, difference between you and a lot of organisations who are in this to almost like do a bit of a quick fix and sort of patch over some of the wounds. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't not. There are a huge number of small community organisations who are really, you know, purely with volunteers doing their best to, you know, find local farmers and whatever who've got a corner of a field or whatever it is who will allow them to plant, you know, 10, 20, 100 trees and so on. And they're doing their best. And I really applaud them for that. The problem is that we there is no guarantee of permanency, whether those trees will be there in 10, 20 years time. We don't know. Um, and so that's the problem. I'm not going to knock what they're doing, but it's very, you know, they're doing their best given the, all the multiple crises we face. Uh, and I, I would admit the challenge that we've taken on is something that not everyone can take on. Um, but um, in terms of the greenwash issue, yes, I mean, it is something that we've had to confront because what we've had is companies and individuals, but mainly companies telling us that they want to offset so we have a carbon offsetting policy and it's a tricky one because we don't want to be part of a greenwashing, uh, you know, facade. And so we have made it very clear that we will, we understand everybody's on a carbon journey. We will accept carbon offsetting money where a company can show us that they genuinely are trying to cut their emissions. Now that has actually meant that even before we had our major funding, we were having to turn down funds, which was pretty painful. Sometimes, you know, several thousand pounds at a, in a go because the company really wasn't prepared to engage on that front. They seemed to think they could carry on doing what they wanted to do, but just plant a few trees. Um, uh, and, and we weren't prepared to be part of that. So, so yes, I, we're acutely conscious of that. But for most organisations like us, like us at the moment, you know, offsetting is something that we have to face every day and judge <laughs> which side of the line each offer falls on. So when you talk about, um, you know, this whole idea of, you know, refusing money and refusing donations, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a very kind of confident, very assertive kind of position. And I guess a lot of um, organisations would probably sort of buckle under the, the pressure to make those tactical gains. Um, and, and also you're facing this you know, huge area. I mean, you talk about sort of Bristol Avon catchment, that is a big geographic area with a lot of challenges, you know, from, from the perspective, even you know, just even focusing on that simple thing of floodplain. Um, I mean, where do you go next? This is a big, big old thing to, to kind of bite off, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, look at the catchment area. It, it is huge. Um, and I guess, yes, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say we're not going to solve Bristol's flood problems, um, you know, not alone or certainly not within the next 20 years. We can make a contribution and we can certainly, you know, make a contribution, a quite significant contribution at local level. And it will stop and slow water going into our water system and finding its way down into the major conurbations. Um, but yes, I'm not going to overstate our uh, 
impact on that, you know, that we can have in a short period of time, unless we really get much more support in the years coming, which is quite possible as, you know, I mean, um, I, 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 you know, more and more organisations are waking up, particularly given the flooding that we had in across the UK over winter, more and more organisations are waking up to the fact that natural flood management is both more cost efficient than building whopping great barriers. I mean, I heard on a, I hate to say it, a, a, well, a Radio 4 programme, Costing the Earth, uh, a couple of weeks ago, about how Kendall in Cumbria is looking at six miles of cement walls through the middle of the town in order to control their flooding problem. Now, I know other towns up north, um, I believe Pickering and others, have really spent a fraction of the what was being allocated to their engineered budget by putting it into earth bunds, tree planting, hedge planting, making rivers meander and so on, all sorts of a variety of natural uh, uh, flood mitigation um, uh, measures. And that has been hugely cost effective. So I think more money may come our way in the future, um, you know, as we get established and as people appreciate the level of the problem that we face. Um, but I guess that remains to, to be seen. I guess what you're doing really then is part of your, um, obviously your writing um, that, mm -hmm. uh, that you were doing sort of before um, the charity was set up and um, obviously the promotional kind of work that you're doing now. I guess a lot of it, um, has got to be around partnering then hasn't it because you you've used the word sort of partners and supporters and and this very much collaborative sort of co-created um environment that you seem to be fostering i mean do, do you see the future sort of growth of, of this particular sector and these particular initiatives as being about partnering yes yes i mean the more it is difficult of course every partnering organization comes with its own challenges i mean a major chunk of the money that we've got at the moment is from the national Lot uh, lottery heritage fund um and you know they've been hugely supportive they come with their own demands um which we're very happy to satisfy because again another part of our objective is to use our land as a an educational tool as well to get people to understand our biodiversity and our um climate change crisis um so um i guess they've just moved us much further along the lines but it means that we have a lot a heavy burden in terms of reporting and monitoring and administration that comes with that level of funding so i guess every partner organization comes with that um i guess but sure yes we will we will need to partner we would love to partner with more councils um uh you know with more um nature-based organizations as we go forward um i guess we're going to need all that i still think our biggest strength will be the public um you know as the public understand the need and are hugely supportive and they really get the point of a local project you know they want to come and plant trees on our land and they want to be able to come and see the bats and the biodiversity growing on our land and hear the reports of that specifically on something that they've contributed to and so you know i think a large part of our, our support base will always be from them too mm, this is just so exciting isn't it, it really <laughs> is the more you talk you know the more kind of ideas i'm sort of seeing sort of yeah. emerge from all of this what, what's your big dream then where where do you see you talk about a 20-year window um br bring that back maybe to say sort of 10 years time to start with and then maybe then look out to the 20. 10 years time how's this, this thing going to look and then 20? Do you know I, I don't often sit down and look uh, into that crystal ball because um, because it's a very murky one I can't really see how much we will have achieved in that time. As I say in general I think I'd like to think that we were buying a chunk of 20 to 30 acres per year that would be good and if it's strategically done then I think you know we can say that we're all, we're going to be making a contribution in uh, particular areas um, I think as I say there is a big possibility that within as we're more established you know within three four five years we're going to find more organizations coming to us and saying that actually they get it and you know how can we partner with them so that would be my dream i mean for example we were at the beginning of the year we were approached by a major engineering company and they had decided that they needed to uh, to offset their emissions they weren't in uh, buildings engineering um they needed to reforest around 10 acres i don't know was it 
was it uh, 10 hectares I think um, and uh, but they don't they want to own the land but they don't want to plant the trees they don't want to manage it uh, and so on our point to them was will those trees be permanent it, will there be a covenant on those trees um, to make sure that they are still there in 50 to 100 years time and onwards from there and they said absolutely it is that's our intention so you know on that the basis and I can see that kind of partnership working much more in the future so I'm hoping that we will um, be able to do much more than the 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 individual land purchases that we can do so if you've piqued the interest of an individual or uh, somebody who represents a business and they think you know we want to get involved here um how can they contact you uh just look on the website and uh, there's an email address on there contact us through there and we're very happy to hear from anybody who would like to be part of our journey well it's a wonderful initiative and i'm um, really really grateful for your time today nikki oh, it's my pleasure thank you